We've been talking about Thomas Aquinas's five ways of establishing God's existence. Today I want to talk about the fourth way. It's a way that doesn't get much respect, and for some good reasons, but I'll later suggest there is a way of reconstructing it. So today we're going to talk about it as he presents it, and there are a lot of problems with it. I'm not going to deny that. In fact, I want to investigate the problems. But there is something deeper going on in the background. In part, Aquinas is giving us his version of a very powerful argument in Anselm's Monologian, something written about 150 years before Aquinas. But Anselm is a Platonist, Aquinas is an Aristotelian, and so he has to reject some of the metaphysical assumptions that are there in Anselm's argument. Well, that weakens it in some ways. And so I think that's responsible for some of the unconvincing character of Aquinas' argument. But I'll argue that actually there's something deeper in the background, something that we need to investigate Aristotle to really uncover. But I'll save that for a later video. Now let's look at the argument as Aquinas presents it. The fourth way is taken from the gradation to be found in things. Among beings, there are some more and some less good, true, noble, and the like. But more and less are predicated of different things, according as they resemble in their different ways something which is the maximum, as a thing is said to be hotter, according as it more nearly resembles that which is hottest. So that there is something which is truest, something best, something noblest, and, consequently, something that is uttermost being. For those things that are greatest in truth are greatest in being, as it's written in Metaphysics 2. Now the maximum in any genus is the cause of all in that genus, as fire, which is the maximum heat, is the cause of all hot things. Therefore there must also be something which is to all beings the cause of their being, goodness, and every other perfection. And this we call God. Well, here's how I interpret that argument's structure, at least on its surface. First premise, some things are more F, <laughs> where F is some perfection, are better, are truer, or more, are more noble, even exist more truly, more really than others. So some things are better than others, some things are truer than others, some things are more noble than others. Now, second premise, one thing is more F than another if it more closely resembles what is maximally F. So one thing is better than another if it more closely resembles the best possible thing. One thing is nobler than another if it more closely resembles the noblest thing, and so on. So there must be something that is maximally F for all of these perfections F. There must be something that is the best thing, something that is the noblest thing, something that is the truest thing, something that is the most really existent thing. Well, anything that is maximally F for every perfection F is also maximally real. That is to say, as he puts it, uttermost being, maxime entia. What is maximally F is the cause of all the Fs. So what is maximally good is the cause of all good things. What is maximally noble is the cause of all noble things, and so on. Therefore, something is the cause of everything else, and everything's being, goodness, and all other perfections. We call that God. So God exists. Now, at first glance, I think this looks like just a terrible, terrible argument. Why? Well, let's look at the first premise. It seems fine. Some things are better than others. Some things are truer than others. Some things are more noble than others. Okay. It's a little odd to say some things exist more truly or more really. Some things are more real than others. That's something in part that Aquinas is inheriting from an earlier doctrine of the great chain of being. But to some extent it seems plausible. We can go all the way back to Plato's Republic, where he says, look, shadows, reflections, they in some sense seem less real than the thing reflected, than the thing of which they're the shadows. Images, pictures, seem somehow less real than the thing they're pictures of. And so that idea that some things are more real, some things are less real, that's not that absurd a notion. We don't tend to talk that way, but it's not crazy. Now let's look at the second premise. One thing is more F than another, more 
noble, for example, than another? If it more closely resembles, what is maximally F? What is, say, maximally noble? The noblest thing. Well, it seems plausible if anything is maximally F, but why think that anything is, for example? His example here is not encouraging, by the way. He says, well, one thing's hotter than another if it more closely resembles the maximum hotness. But what do you mean, maximum hotness? Is there such a thing as maximum hotness? There is such a thing as maximum cold, zero degrees Kelvin, where the molecules of a thing are not moving at all. Is there such a thing as maximum heat, a thing that is heated up as hot as it can be? Is there a maximal heat? I'm not sure. <laughs> what if molecular motion is entirely the speed of light? Hmm, maybe that's a maximum heat. mc squared. In any case, whatever we want to say about that in terms of an ultimate physics, that doesn't seem a premise that we can build into an argument like this. This is supposed to be natural theology. It's okay to use experiential premises, a posteriori premises, but they can't be things of detailed scientific theory. They have to be things that any ordinary person could observe. And that's surely not something like that. There's another example that's disturbing. If we think about number, just think about more and less period rather than more true, more noble, etc., but just more. Well, we could say that one number is greater than another if it more closely resembles the maximum number. But what maximum number? There is no such thing as the maximum number. And so it looks as if this premise just fails in its own terms. That seems pretty disturbing. Now, it is pretty plausible to think that we can form a comparative, something that grammatically is often called a scalar, if there is a scale. And so to say, well, we can think of one thing as better than another, for example, if we have a scale of goodness. To think of one thing as more noble than another, we have to have a scale of nobility. To think of one thing as more existent, more really existent than another, we better have a scale of reality. Now, that seems reasonable enough. That seems highly plausible, actually. But we don't really need a maximum on that scale. We need the scale. We need maybe a measure or something like that. But we don't have to have a maximum point on that scale. Now, what's going on here? I mentioned Anselm's argument. We'll talk about that in a separate video. But the basic idea there is that we get up to a maximum which is the form of the good, the form of the noble, the form of existence. But Aquinas doesn't have that kind of abstract form. His forms are all in the things. The goodness is in the thing. There is no abstract form of goodness that can serve as the kind of maximum that Anselm has. And so here's a place where it looks like giving up Platonism loses something crucial to Anselm's way of thinking about this argument. Anything that's maximally F for every perfection F is also maximally real. Uttermost being, maxime entia. Well, if we include reality, being, among the perfections, then okay, this seems trivially true. He wants to reject Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God. If God is just defined as a being with all perfections, and existence is a perfection, poof, God exists. In fact, that's the argument of Descartes' fifth meditation. But that's not something that Aquinas accepts as a form of argument. It would be an a priori argument for the existence of God, and he doesn't think that's really possible. Why? Because it means we would have to grasp the essence of God. We would have to be able to define God as the perfect being, for example, the being with all perfections. He doesn't think that's possible. Comprehending God really lies beyond us. So that's not something he can accept. But if he doesn't accept that, well, can he accept that existence is a perfection? Maybe he doesn't really have to reject that part. He can just reject the idea that we can define God as the perfect being. So maybe he can treat this simply as one of those perfections. But at least we're getting on risky ground. You can see how Anselm and Descartes would be waiting in the wings to say, aha, it is possible now to have an a priori argument. There's something else, though, going on here, I think. And that is that, well, we have to have something that is maximal now for every perfection, not just for each perfection. 
This is something that happens in Anselm too, and Anselm has an argument, but here the argument seems lacking. <clears throat> if there has to be a maximum to make sense of the comparatives, then we have to have something that is truest. We have to have something that is most noble. We have to have something that is best. We have to have something that exists most truly, most really. But why should we assume those are all the same thing? In other words, we get a bunch of maximum points. What brings them together? Well, we can say they're all perfection, so we can talk about the more and less perfect. Maybe that gives us a maximum perfection. Maybe, but that's not the way he presents the argument. It looks like we slide from each of these terms has to have a maximum to something has to be the maximum for all of them, all of them at once. That the truest thing is the noblest thing, is the most existent thing, and so on. Now, I think Aquinas means in this premise to bring them together, because he thinks that, basically, anything that's maximum for any of these must also be maximally real. But again, why is that right? Why is it that the truest thing has to be the realest thing? Why does the best thing have to be the most real thing? There's nothing in the argument that tells us. Finally, let's look at premise five. What's maximally F is the cause of all Fs. That's a strange premise. Why should it be true? Let's suppose fire is the maximally hot thing. The tea kettle is hot. Does that mean fire caused the tea kettle? That seems strange. The water's hot. Did fire cause the water? Let's say it's a hot day outside. Well, the day is hot. Does that mean fire caused the day? That, that seems like a very strange way of talking. At best, it seems like we could say, well, fire is the cause of the water's being hot, the cause of the heat in the water, the cause of the day's being hot, the cause of the heat of the day, something like that. That seems pretty plausible. But then we don't get this ultimately perfect thing as the cause of all the other things. We get it being the cause of their goodness, the cause of their nobility, the cause of their trueness, <laughs> the cause maybe of their reality, so maybe we get in, but again it's going to depend critically on how we think of existence and whether it is one of those perfections, whether it has a maximum, whether its maximum has to be the same as all the others. And so, as it's presented, this argument seems puzzling. I think the key to it is something we've ignored in our reconstruction. He says at one point, as Aristotle says in Metaphysics 2, the key to this argument is really hidden in Metaphysics 2. And so to understand how Aquinas is actually thinking about this and what the real structure of the argument is, we have to go back and look at Aristotle. We'll do that in our next video.